blessing to be here, uh, being amongst the crowd. And again, uh, the lights are extremely blinding, so I can't see anybody, but I do love this community. Um, I've been coming here, I think, since 2014, 2015 timeframe. And just again, um, I, and it, it's excited to see all the new folks here as well. And, and uh, you know, if you're coming into the OT uh, side, if you're kind of new to this, uh, welcome. Uh, this is your family, and uh, we um, excited to have you. So with that, um, again, I've spent a, a number of years doing, um, you know, automation, those kind of things going to the next slide. But what I wanted to share about this is working now um, in my current role, I do a lot of tabletops. And this is something as an, a former asset owner and operator, it's something that I wasn't very familiar with doing is how do you do that? It always felt kind of complicated, maybe a little tricky, um, but, but that's, but you know, doing it now, it's absolutely something that you can go take back even next week uh, and begin planning your own tabletop. And that's really my goal of this talk here. So again, as Tim alluded to, i um, been in the business a couple of years, uh, started out as instrumentation, went into automation, went into analytical, uh, went into uh, custody transfer measurement, uh, been upstream, downstream, supported midstream, global operations, global security, um, and then moving into um, where my role is now with Dragos, uh, so where I do a lot of this. So if I'm not in uh, and instructing uh, classes and with you all, uh, I'm uh, doing uh, different service engagements and so forth with uh, Dragos. So with that said, let's get into this a little bit. So um, I've been into a lot of organizations that they have a plan, an instant response plan, but, but it's what the value of an instant response plan is to actually have it tested, to actually know if it works to know where your, your issues are within your company. Um, I, I've, again, seen a lot of, of good uh, efforts out there around, hey, let's create all this wonderful documentation, but it becomes digital, um, you know, digital dust. I mean, after a while, if people don't know where their plans are, they never use it, they never execute it, and they don't know what's going on. So it's important um, that, that you have a plan. It's not your IT plan. It's an OT specific plan. Um, if you were in the class yesterday and the, and the newer course is being developed, they talked a little bit about this as well around, you cannot copy an IT playbook and put it in OT. It just doesn't work. There's too many differenti differentialities, too many nuances there and so forth. And again, it's, you need to have a tested plan. Um, just something jotted down, uh, something that you think might work, uh, may not. Um, so a, again, Having that that uh, IR plan, um, you know, just think about all the different areas within it. What you need to do from a preparation standpoint of view, create it. Uh, you also need to update it. Uh, people change, roles change, processes change. Your IR plan absolutely needs to be updated and so forth. Part of that preparation as well is having um, all your other playbooks in place, um, getting all those built out, communication um, capabilities all, all built out as well, HR. All the different things that we as technical folks don't think about, but absolutely comes into play. And as we go along too, we have identification of where and how and who is going to identify the event. How is it going to be uh, stood up from an event to an incident? Where is that threshold? All those kind of things need to be documented in your plan. As we move on to containment, going into how do you isolate from a host uh, VLAN perspective or even IT, OT, you know, break that bridge. Uh, can your plant slash environment handle that breakage from the IT to OT component? Um, and some environments, you, you, you sever that and, and you can't move molecules down the pipe. You can't get food orders in and out if you're doing food processing. Uh, things just don't work. And again, getting down into root cause, you know, think about a containment eradication, how that's a very, very reciprocal nature type thing when you're in an incident, knowing that and, and how to work through it. And then from a recovery perspective, do you have backups? Are they tested? And who is actually responsible for it? I've been in a lot of different uh, cases where the, the asset owner operator would say, well, my vendor's got my backups. And then you say, okay, well, during this event, uh, you call them up and the vendors, uh, they have done the initial backup from the initial build. But that was like five years ago. Those backups probably aren't going to be very helpful in the event of an incident. So just understanding all that and then getting something in from a feedback perspective into the lessons learned. So you develop your plan, you do a, a plan review if it's annual or when it's changed. Um, again, folks in different industries are very used to this. Uh, and then you do some sort of an annual tabletop. Now, again, um, why do we do this? I think I kind of already alluded to that as part of the five critical controls, but also we're seeing 
from the NERC SIP perspective, if you're in that environment, you're used to doing this, so very, very regulated. Also from uh, TSA, so for those in the oil and gas and pipeline industries, midstream and so forth, those, the new SD2C regulation coming out is saying you have to do a tabletop, you have to do it annually, and it's part of their whole uh, process. So we're seeing a lot of regulations building in the requirements to do tabletops. So a lot of you may be coming in here and going, now I'm, I'm in this industry and I'm now required to do a tabletop. Where do I go and how do I do it? I've got a timeline I'm under. It's just, it's also just best practice. Just to, to, to again, like I've alluded to is understanding it, will your playbooks work? Um, are they fit for purpose? Uh, do, are, are we thinking a little too high level of generically in some of our plans? What about all the nuance and the details of how do we do forensics? Uh, those kind of things. Do we have our instant response retainers, uh, you know, documented in place? Are we relying too much maybe on one person or one SME? Um, and then also, fortunately, um, and, and maybe unfortunately, but fortunately, our environments don't get breached very often. Uh, so when you think about that, you have this plan out there. And if you don't test it and you're never breached, how do you know if that plan will work? And, and we're unfortunately, we're seeing though more targeted attacks to OT systems with a lot of ransomware going on. So, I mean, it, within your IR plan, you absolutely need to be dealing with what will happen if we get hit with ransomware in different areas of our network. How do we, how do we handle that? Ransomware is out there. It's, it's a lot of companies and the OT side are getting hit with ransomware. Uh, a lot of it's unfortunately due to poor architecture. But, uh, but it's happening. And again, um, one of the things that I love about tabletops is it brings people together and it brings people from different walks of life together within the company, um, you know, from leadership, from operations, from engineering, from uh, automation and instrumentation. You bring these, all, these people together and they can talk through about their systems and their understanding. Uh, people begin to, again, form those relationships. Um, but, but also it allows people to walk through and say, so when this incident is going on, so you from the SOC team, how are you going to detect this? Uh, okay, well, uh, we, there may be some gaps there. So how do you respond back to that site that's across the country or across the world when, when the, the, the remote SOC team is, is monitoring that? And, and, and you just identify all kinds of things within these tabletops where there's a lot of presumptions, but it's never really been tested out. Um, so again, just very, very helpful. So when you think about tabletops, so is who should participate in them? Um, I, I love this slide because it, it shows the different types of tabletops you can actually do. Again, from a site plan perspective, you have your automation folks. Um, you have also have INE or INC technicians. That's where I started uh, my, my career. Um, just the people that are boots on the ground that are they're interfacing with the PLCs and the HMIs and all the controllers, the smart transmitters and all those things. Those are the folks that may be, you know, the eyes and ears of a lot of the systems. You also have the OT security folks at larger sites. You will have dedicated OT staff. Uh, we're seeing that more and more, which is a great thing. So if I'm going to do a tabletop and a very, very technical tabletop focus, I want to have those people in the room or remote. Um, if I'm going to, you know, dealing with ITOT cybersecurity, um, you know, definitely want to, you know, I've done a number of tabletops that are just targeted around the, the SOC folks and, and the IT, IT staff and a, and a couple of OT staff. And so my, my injects and the kind of the tabletop I'm going to run is going to be very different than a site and a plant-based focused. And again, I love to get leadership in the room when we do these. Uh, and especially like with executives. So lately, we, um, I've had the opportunity to take part in a number of executive tabletops where the, the again, the, um, the conversations, the kind of things that we're, we're covering within those tabletops is very, very different than it would be at a plant. Um, I'm absolutely not going to talk about pulling out PLC code and, and, and analyzing it and looking at host uh, forensics and stuff when an executive is in the room. That is the wrong conversation to have. But it, what is the right conversation to have is this plant is now going down. There are no backups. The plant's been ransomed. What, what are the, some of the community environmental um, boardroom type discussions from, a, you know, all, all those kind of things come into play from an executive level. And so I've actually found it's really, very, very helpful to have 
uh, when, you, you, when you're running an executive type tabletop is to have the executives in a room and have your plant and your other teams working in conjunction and feeding back up like you would on a normal large scale incident and feeding back um, all the things that are the activities that are going on in the groups. But you still will, will push those the executive folks to make decisions on ransomware payment, all the kind of a hard decisions from news media, um, communications, all those kind of things that, that absolutely need to be tested and, and, and laid out. Um, but, but yet again, to have that integrated tabletop is extremely helpful. So now we've identified that tabletops are good, but who's going to actually run them? You've got a couple of options here. If you've never done a tabletop before, I would actually recommend that you go to an external party, an external consultancy company. And there's a couple of them out there. Um, the, the reason why you would want to do this is because you'll get a, a good foundation of, of how they're actually run. And what I'm talking about today is an example of, of, of doing it. Um, but they've done it before. They've done it a lot. Um, like myself, I do a number of tabletops a year, and, and you just become very, very familiar with doing it. So you, you'll learn from the people that have done it a lot. You can take those learnings back in your company um, and build out your own capability within your company. Um, also, we found, and I find all, all the time, is when I go to a, a tabletop within a company, the people within the company look to me as the expert. It, even if I'm not, um, but they look to me as the expert, and 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 also the scenario that we provide, they don't they don't fight it as much. And fighting a scenario in a tabletop is very very challenging because when you're facilitating and somebody says, "Well, that can't happen in my site," um, it just it, it it really kind of throws it off. So when you design a good tabletop, you bring in external folks um, that that the internal company recognizes you as the expert. It just goes so much better. Also, when like myself, if I come in, I, I, I don't really care how well or how, or how um, poorly that tabletop goes. It's not on me. Um, I'm there to facilitate something, to provide a learning opportunity, to coach, to train, and, and those kind of things. But at the end of the day, um, it's, it doesn't look bad on me if it goes poorly. Um, now, they may not bring me back in, but at the end of the day, um, it, it still, it, I, I'm not as concerned about that and the outcome. So there's the other way as well. So you can also do this internally. And I would actually fully recommend that you folks build up this capability. Um, one of the, there's a couple of the reasons why you'd want to do this internally is you know your systems. You know uh, where the dead bodies are buried, if you will. Um, you know those, uh, the, those, those things that, you, you know, it's like, oh, you know, if you, if you shut this thing down, it'll trip the plant. Or, or if you compromise this one host, you could take the, the environment out. So you know your weak spots, and it really helps. Um, it's also, of course, less expensive, but time is money, and it, these things take a lot of time to build out, to develop, to, um, you know, to, to just get in play. Um, and, and then, of course, there's a lot of nice organic working relationships. So once you get to that point to, where you get comfortable with this, um, these are fun to do internally and, uh, and recommended. So we've kind of talked about who, and now let's understand how to design it. So before I get into this, let's, let's talk about some considerations. I've seen a number of tabletops, and one of the biggest complaints I have when I walk in is they say, thanks for coming in, and I hope you're better than last year's tabletop. I hope, you know, it's like, oof, this is going to be rough. Um, you know, when, when, when people will say that last year's tabletop was terrible because, uh, you know, the formal company or the people who, who uh, you know, did it last time, they, they compromised like one machine, maybe in the L3 uh, Purdue model or even in the DMZ and said, oh, wow, your company's screwed now, you know, and, and it's like it didn't do anything. There was no impact to the environment. So ending a tabletop at the wrong level, at the wrong impact is not good. Um, also, you know, you absolutely need to, again, wherever the tabletop is designed for the group, you need to impact that group so they will actually have something to do. If you have an operations staff in the room, you need to have something about process interruption. They need to do something about, uh, about that uh, injection, the artifacts and so forth. Also um, around this, when you, when you get into this, and this is something actually I struggled with right up front is because you think about a tabletop and it's just, it slides and it's injects and you're building out a storyboard. That doesn't sound cool. It's not very techy. You're not, you're not like, you know, like penetration testing or something, that's, that's awesome. But, 
But these are a lot of fun. And I'll get into reason why, because the tabletop can be extremely technical if you want it to be. And it can almost be like a, a paper penetration test. And we've done, the, the, done them before, where at the end of the tabletop, they're like, wow, we've got a lot of things to go back and begin to remediate within our systems. So don't think about these as just testing out a playbook or testing out an IR plan. Think about these as a way to identify gaps within your controls, gaps within your programs and so forth, and be able to take that back and get them remediated. So again, uh, where do you begin? Where do you get, begin with, with designing this out? There's a couple of different types of doing this. So one is you can create a threat group or, or not create a threat group, you can use a threat group. Um, and the nice thing is here too, is that your IR plan should have been built from a threat perspective from a adversarial perspective. Who is out there? So you overlay um, the different types of attacks that we've seen. Uh, if you're in the electrical industry, of course, Ukraine type of attacks. If you're in oil and gas, Xenotime, Koblite, and all those others. But you overlay the threat groups and you, you build out your incident response capability from that. And then that's how you actually overlay your controls, the SANS-5 critical controls. That's where those are coming from is a threat perspective and the things that actually work well. So there's another way to do it as well, though. So you can do it from a threat group perspective, or you can do it a target base. Um, I kind of like the target base because it's more fun, but uh, it, it's you kind of choose your own path here. And both of them are very, very good. A target base is one where, again, you're actually doing kind of like that paper type penetration test where you actually I look at the architecture, you look at gaps and those kind of things and, and consider what are those uh, areas where it could be a plausible type of an, of an attack path coming in and you play this out. Um, so from a throw group perspective, again, it's not so much that you really need to have that in-depth knowledge of the site. What you're really wanting to do again is to determine that the threat group uh, what you're, and then you overlay like a, the minor attack type uh, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. You overlay from that, and then you go through the environment and you look and see where can, where do we have the detective controls on this? So if I have a compromise to a, a workstation, uh, where am I? Where can I detect that? Um, how could that actually take place? And you just kind of go through each one of these, and you you build out your injects and your artifacts based off of um, these TTPs. The other way to do it again is targeted though. So if you're going to go for a targeted approach, you absolutely need to know your environment. And so one of the things that I do first is I, you need to kind of do an architecture type of a review. You need to know your <clears throat> firewall rules. You need to know your, um, all your connections, uh, data flows, um, all those kind of things to, to again, identify some sort of a plausible path of how an adversary might breach and come through here. Um, so again, What's really nice to do is, is if you have done a penetration testing report, like an assumed breach coming in from a DMZ, uh, it's really helpful to use that information to build this out. Um, also, though, I've, a lot of times I've just taken now network, network data flows, combined with firewall rules, combined with some configurations things, and you can build out a nice tabletop that will probably provide some after action uh, information and some remediation needed going back in. Um, one thing too, though, is when I've done this before, uh, and recently I did one in a generation site, which was phenomenally architected. Um, so, but, but I mean, there's data diodes in there and those kind of things. And, and they were talking about, so on the attack path perspective, uh, you know, I was like, I'm not sure how to do this. But, but also what was brought up is like, hey, we have a bunch of TSAs that we use, transient cyber assets, and we're very concerned about those during uh, generation uh, times. And so, or, or maintenance outages on our generation plants. And so with that, it's like, oh, let's do a TSA um, with, with vendors coming in using laptops and using an infection vector again, coming in from the side versus coming in from the top down. Again, they're using data diodes, can't do that. We could come in from the side and come up with a very, very plausible scenario for that. So again, there's a lot of different ways, but at the end of the day, what you really want to do and not like you, you you're trying to do this, but have some sort of impact to your plant, to like that generation site, to where it would trip the, the cogen offline, or um, you, know, you have some sort of a uh, control system Im uh, impact to where your operation teams, your maintenance teams and engineering teams need to respond to that event and escalate it up into OT security and, and go beyond. 
Also, we need to think about where we start from that approach, from a top-down or a bottom-up perspective. Again, if I am going to be dealing with predominantly security folks, um, folks like us in a room, um, and it didn't again it depends. So if I'm dealing with more of an IT bent team or with an ITOT combined SOC, what I want to do is when I start that tabletop, I want to start it where they get an initial type of a, um, you know, some sort of an alert goes off in their SIM uh, or, or some something other happens to where, you know, how in their normal day in day life job, how would they normally see this at the beginning? Uh, so it's an alert that pops up. They're going to track that down, get a hold of the plant, uh, and so forth. And they're going to work that, that whole process from that perspective. And then they'll go into the, the full-fledged incident, incident response teams get spun up, they go uh, deploy that, and so forth. So that is one way of doing it if I'm doing pre predominantly from a ITOT perspective. When I go from a plant perspective, though, I definitely want to go from that cyber event, like something is already occurring. And this actually happens... Um, probably more often due to lack of visibility. A lot of our sites don't have the visibility from a network or host base perspective. So a lot of times the operators or your, your engineering staff or so forth may be the first eyes on the scene saying that, hey, my control system is not working right. I've got a misoperation somewhere. And what do we do? Is this, is this like with a safety system that tripped offline in the refinery for the Xenotime attack? Is that a firmware problem? Is that a, you know, a software problem? Or are we under some sort of a cyber attack? And so going from this is very, very good because it's, you're involving those teams and you're allowing them to think through that, hey, we live in a day and age that it might just, it might be more than the equipment failure. This might be something else. And it helps the technicians and the operations, again, know, go walk through their process and response plans, but also, um, it, it helps the overall teams and, and the incident response team know to have, to have that combined response. So when you create the, a tabletop, all a tabletop is really is, so I've talked a lot about architectures and threat groups and stuff like that, but when you, when you build it out, it's, you're creating a story and you can create it with this called a master scenario events list. And so when you do incident response beyond just cyber, incident response is a very, very uh, mature type of a, a um, uh, area, but but so in cyber it's uh, it's maturing, um, but but nevertheless, so a master event scenario list is used a lot in in lar very large incidents, um, and and for planning them out for playing them out, but you can use a spreadsheet, you can use um, OneNote. Uh, I've actually seen some nice visual programs for doing uh, these, where you lay out your injects and your times and so forth. But but when you just start in this, all you need is a is a spreadsheet where you lay out your injects. So the injects that are popping up, you can lay out um, leading questions from the facilitator, uh, those kind of things. You can also lay out, um, you, you can lay out each inject map to those pickerel levels from your incident response plan. So make sure you're testing each area of your response plan and not uh, missing anything. You can also include some expected outcomes or, or what you think the team should be doing at this point. And then also an area to capture notes if you're capturing notes in another area. And so this allows you to build out your, your story and keep track of your story as you're going through. Now, when you think about it, an incident, um, the time of an incident matters a lot. So you can do a real-time incident where you're, it's like you're starting at 8.30 in the morning and, and you're, you're going through and you're saying, okay, in 20 minutes, this is gonna happen. And in another 20 minutes, we're going to have this next inject drop and all those kind of things. In certain tabletops, that actually works. Um, oftentimes, no. And the reason why is because uh, every 20 minutes is, is way fast. And, and even though in a real life scenario, there may be systems being compromised, if there's a worm in the environment and different systems are going down, that could be very realistic. But a lot of times your injects need to be stretched over time. Like for first inject, Two days ago, this is going on. It may be being a news briefing. It could be a threat threat scenario briefing, or it could have been, hey, plant was had some maintenance on done on it a couple of days ago. Now we go up to, hey, yesterday there were some different activities going on in my next inject, and then boy, a shift change this morning, my DCS controller is tripped offline, and so you can you can move your your timeline to make it kind of make sense. Uh, so that is one thing to think about as you're building this out. When I also build these out, and these, again, these are all guidelines, nothing here is fixed in stone, but, I, but a, a tabletop scenario that lasts about two to three hours, it feels about right. 
If you've ever been in one of these that, that is uh, less than this, you, just, you don't get enough uh, conversations in. If you go beyond like three hours, people get worn out. I mean, this is a lot of activity. There's a lot of conversations, a lot of stress. Um, that being said, I'm about ready to go into a tabletop that we're gonna, we're planning it out for six hours. Um, so that'll be a fun day. Um, nevertheless, so between in about three hours, you can get into about 10, six to 10 injects, depending upon how fast they drop and how, how fast you want things to move. Um, again, 20 to, to 15 to 20 minutes per inject is about the right time, the right cadence with that. Um, so when you build this out, essentially what you're doing is that you take that MISOL document and then you throw some slides together. So you add the overall scenario, you include your injects, uh, and then you include some artifacts. So with the inject is something that's going on at a certain time. And then a lot of times you'll provide some artifacts behind that to allow to give people context. And what that allows people to do, so if it's technical, I'm going to have a very, very technical uh, type of an artifact. So maybe some PCAPs for people, maybe some logs. A log entries, it may be uh, images, uh, those kind of things. So if I'm doing a ransomware event, I'm going to have a, you know, my SCADA consoles with some ransom uh, notes on it, those kind of things. Just provide some people from with some context. Uh, if this is an executive one, of course, it's going to look totally different than this. But that's how you do it. You have injects and artifacts. And then you have at the end of the deck, you have a hot wash meeting or an after action review. And then um, also how and kind of a backup story of how it worked. Especially when I do a, a targeted type of a tabletop, um, people um, are often wondering how on earth could this work? And so a lot, a lot of times I like to build out that attack path at the end of the day and, and explain to people how that was plausible. Doesn't mean it could happen, but it was a plausible attack path that might need to go be reviewed and, and see how plausible it is. It may be um, very realistic. So, all oftentimes as well as when I'm when I'm working through this, and it's it's very natural uh, within our companies to have one one person that we look at as is that is the lead person for incident response, or that is the SME at the plant, and I I absolutely you know everybody goes to this one person. Well, what happens when that person is gone? What happens when that person is at SANS training? Uh, you know, getting uh, you know what the, the new stuff on the hyper encabulator or they're on vacation, um, you know, at a nice place. So what I like to do is take the lead people out. And, and, and this, this kind of shakes up the, the team and it shakes up the group, but I like to pull people out of the, of, of the, um, of the tabletop and you don't have to pull them out the whole time because um, th those people might actually be really excited to be in it. So you don't want to pull them out the entire time, but you do want to pull them out for a part of it at least. And the reason why is the teams have to figure out, okay, now I, we, who's our backup? So that was our primary incident responder or our, our IR lead. Um, when that person's not available, who's backing them up? Who do we go to next? Who's the fallback? Is that person actually identified in the IR plan? So it's fun to take people out. Um, and, and so I try to do this in, in most of our scenarios. Also, when you're, you're developing this, you, you're, you're tweaking and you're testing a lot of different things. And it's good to get approvals, especially if you're going to hire a consultancy company. Yeah, a lot of times you'll have an initial meeting, figure out the scope, figure out what systems we're going to be doing. And then we have a midpoint meeting where we've built out most of the things. The slides are about 80% there. Um, you know, the, the MESOL document's all built out. And then we have a final meeting where we'll review everything, making sure that all the story is right, nothing needs to be changed. We lock that in place and then we actually will go and play it. One of the things too that I've, I've found, and this has happened a couple times, is the people that are building this story out, um, I like to keep them out of the actual players. And the reason why is because people will, will and it's, it's, they're not trying to do it, but it's just human nature. It's like, hey, I know what's coming up next. And they'll shout off to their team that, oh, hey, just wait for the Inject 7. That's going to be a doozy. Um, th that doesn't help. Uh, and that's, I call it kind of gaming the TTX. So the people that develop this, I like to, to not have them actually be a player. I like to have them be a you know participant. They can listen in, but don't play or don't game it for your team. Don't ruin it for your team. Just some things to think about. Facilitating, um, I've only got a couple minutes left, but I'll run through this. Facilitating, you can do this in a couple different ways. Um, you can do this remotely. And um, when COVID hit, that's all we were doing is a lot of remote tabletops. Um, so you can do this. 
It's challenging, more challenging, but it can be done. Zoom, Z, uh, Zoom, uh, or Zoom and Teams and those kind of things, whatever you want to use, whatever your medium is. It's nice to have cameras on when you're doing this. Um, I, I hate talking to a black screen all, all day. Um, it's nice to see people's faces, and especially as you're facilitating, it's nice to know who's talking, uh, what group is talking, and so forth. Um, and, and a lot of people think that uh, how, you know, remotely is kind of weird, you know, but it, a lot of times it represents how your company would actually respond. Uh, a lot of times you have your, your central teams and you have remote sites. And during a real incident, when your, your IR teams get spun up, not everybody's going to be at that one site supporting. There's going to be different, uh, you know, uh, telephone lines open. There are different meeting rooms. So, so doing a remote tabletop is actually kind of realistic or there, there actually needs to be some sort of a remote piece, even if you're doing an in-person. So in person, again, it's easier to facilitate. I enjoy it more, kind of like being in this group, being amongst you. It's a lot more fun. I can see reactions. The lights weren't so bright. Um, but so I, I, you know, face to face is nice. And it's also nice to be just just hear the conversations. It's a lot more organic. It's, it's just much more friendly and, um, and fun. So I prefer in person tabletops. But again, you can do it the other way around. So when you're running this, I like to schedule a couple minutes on the on the backstory. Um, take take a quick break, and then you move through each inject. And I'll show that on the next slide. Is the next slide? You this is kind of how it goes. So you have a TTX that begins. I give 20 minutes for a backstory. I get a break in there, a couple minute break, and then after that, as the TTX runs, you just keep dropping your injects, and your artifacts follow injects artifacts. You go to the end of the day. Um, However, that long, however long that is, you have a hot wash meeting where so you have an hour to the hot wash meeting and then you finish up on that tabletop. So again, just an example, they all are different. But when you think about that break, everybody's tired after about three hours, give them a break. It also helps the facilitator and the people that are taking notes to put together the things that went right or wrong. Um, after that break, everybody comes back. You you discuss those top five and bottom five things that, that were, uh, worked well and that needs to be improved. And then you adjourn, you go on from there. So um, this is all about though, it's about self-improvement and improving your company, improving your capabilities, improving your technical controls. Um, and when I run these, again, the, a lot of the outcomes, it is a lot of you know, administrative th type things that need to be improved. Maybe, you know, uh, didn't have the right policies in place, the, no playbooks, all those kind of things we find. But from a technical perspective, uh, a lot of times, you know, companies don't have the right logging in place, the right visibility to have any detection within the scenarios. Um, poor on-site forensic capabilities come up quite a bit. So if you have this host that's compromised, um, you know, where, where is the forensic tool? Have you used it before? Have you used it on this vendor? Do they allow you to use it? All those kind of things need to be kind of fleshed out. And it's an area we often find gaps. Um, again, vendors including uh, in a role to play as well. So this is, again, it's all about building out maturity. And once you do one tabletop, it's like you're not done yet. Keep moving, keep moving to a different site, include different staff. Maybe you want to go into more of an executive type uh, tabletop. Um, and, and I would encourage you to rotate again between internal uh, uh, built out and developed and, and then bring in a third party again occasionally um, to, to help you and to, to help you build out those capabilities. Again, this is all about maturity. It's about improving your response maturity, improving your documentation, your processes, technical controls, making sure that you are, you are ready in the event um, that something malicious happens. So with that said, I have a couple of resources and a similar to a lot of these are going to be, this deck will be available uh, to download as well.